you know, I'll give maybe maybe another minute here and then we'll get started. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. This is Dr. Namish Mohile. He's a professor of neurology and oncology and an Aristide Kamhi professorship in neurology, associate chair for career development and leadership, neuro-oncology division chief, chief and leader of the neuro-oncology service line at the University of Rochester. Uh, Dr. Namish Mohile completed his residency training at Northwestern University. Uh, followed by a fellowship in neuro-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. In 2007, he joined the neurology department at the University of Rochester, where he built and fostered the neuro-oncology division and multidisciplinary brain tumor program. His research focuses primarily on developing and testing therapeutic and supportive care interventions to improve and extend the lives of patients with malignant gliomas. He's a UCNS Fellowship Program Director, serves on the UCNS Certification Committee, chairs the American Society for Clinical Oncology Glioma Guidelines Panel, and is currently the chair-elect of the AAN Section for Neuro-Oncology. As an Associate Chair for Career Development and Leadership, he has spearheaded innovative programs that emphasize personal values, identity, and reflective work in the professional development of faculty, administrative staff, advanced practice providers, and residents. He also directs departmental leadership programs for residents and faculty to develop leadership skills, implement change, and develop resilient teams. Excuse me, at the AAN, he serves as the physician lead for the Transforming Leaders Program. Dr. Mohile aspires to help organizations transform into multicultural, anti-racist, and equitable entities. He's an advocate for incorporating principles of inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism, and social justice into the profession of neurology. And at his home institution of uh, the University of Rochester, he serves as the departmental diversity officer. He's also a member of the NINDS Health Disparities Workforce Development and Diversity Panel. And at the AAN, he chairs the diversity officer subcommittee and is the chair of the AAN Anti-Racism Cultural Work Group. In addition to being a member of the IDEAS subcommittee and a member of the AAN Special Committee for Racism, Inequity, and Social Justice. So uh, we have an excellent, excellent speaker today who's gonna talk to us about uh, innovating care models, and I'll let him uh, take over from here. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Javier. Thank you for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about innovating care models in neuro-oncology and introduce um, a concept called design thinking that we can use in clinical practice development and uh, change management. These are my disclosures. So when I started at the University of Rochester about 15 years ago, um, I, I came to start and develop a program in brain tumors. And one of the things that really daunted me um, was this map of upstate New York. Um, Javier and I were just talking about, um, you know, most people don't know where Rochester is. Um, this star gives you kind of a clue as to where we are. Um, but we serve a fairly large geographic catchment area. This is a few million people. It's about the size um, in geography and population of Kentucky. It has one of the highest cancer uh, rates in the country um, and largely rural communities uh, with some impaired access to primary care physicians and healthcare. Um, and so when we started, um, we really had to think about the gaps in care um, and in teaching and research and how to start filling them. We developed a mission that was to improve and extend the lives of patients with neuro-oncologic disease. It was a broad mission, one um, where we focus on the development of clinical therapeutics, so improving access to clinical trials for patients, uh, where we focused on developing education. So this was a fellowship in neuro-oncology, but also in how we educate our neurologists, oncologists, nurse surgeons, and radiation oncologists, both at our academic medical center and in the community. 
Uh, we worked intentionally to build ties with community oncologists because we realized early on um, that many of the folks in these areas couldn't always make the trip out to Rochester uh, and would be getting some of their care locally. Along with this, also focused on the development of a telemedicine program. And then we started really seeing some of the gaps that I'm gonna talk about in clinical care, both in the region and at our academic medical center uh, and work to make some changes to try to fill those gaps um, and improve our clinical programming. So I'm gonna introduce this idea of design thinking. Um, this is a nonlinear change management process. Um, it's something that is iterative. So as one goes through this process, you can keep going through it until um, a, almost like a continuous process improvement. Um, one of the cores of design thinking is this process called empathize. And what that means is it forces you to sit down and really understand and appreciate the perspectives of all of the stakeholders. Um, in our case, in, it's often patients, caregivers, community members, um, as well as providers, um, including physicians and nurses and APPs. Um, another step is in really defining what the problem is. What, is. what is the thing that you're trying to fix? What is the problem? Is it the right problem? And really then also bringing in that empathize step to understand the problem from other people's perspectives. It's a process that uh, forces you to think through new ideas and new solutions um, so we can innovate the way we do our clinical work. Then developing a prototype, developing a model that one can then evaluate and then going back to some of these other steps to figure out if that model is a realistic model and one that can work. And then testing the model. Um, is this achieving the change that you want to achieve, that you intended? And most importantly, is it affecting the outcomes that really matter? As this is an iterative process, this doesn't have to go in a particular order. One can be at the prototype phase and that learns something from there that redefines or rethinks the problem. Or one can be in the ideating phase and go back and, and hear from other people about what their thoughts are on this. Um, and as I go through this talk, I'm gonna give you some examples of how we might use this in clinical practice change management. So we learned early that patients um, define what our priorities are. Um, and for us, when I, when I started at the University of Rochester, my goals initially were really to develop a program in experimental therapeutics, but we started seeing some real gaps in patient care that we felt like we needed to fix and spend some time on. This is a patient I saw early on. She's a 58-year-old woman. She had an anaplastic astrocytoma. Um, and at that time, before other kind of molecular features, we would have expected a survival maybe ranging from two to five plus years. She came to us um, and was hospitalized um, and it was for, for a, a multitude of symptoms and there were concerns about whether she had recurrence of disease. Um, when we saw her, um, she had been on eight milligrams of dexamethasone daily for 18 months. This was started around the time of her diagnosis and was never stopped. And you can imagine she had moon facies, she had a buffalo hump, she had weight gain, she had acne all over. Um, she had myopathy, she had nearly 10 out of 10 back pain, and she had really every side effect you could imagine from chronic corticosteroid use, but no evidence of recurrence. Um, this image shows that she had multi-level um, uh, bone uh, compression, compression fractures throughout her spine um, that were nearly impossible to manage. And this woman actually ended up going um, uh, into hospice despite the fact um, that she did not have a disease progression. And this got us thinking along with other cases that we saw, saw during that period um, about the supportive care needs of our patients. So even in situations where patients were getting the right treatments, um, how important some of those um, supportive care choices were um, in their quality of their life. And so we started thinking about what our role was as a group in palliative and supportive care. Um, this paper out of your institution um, around that time um, really showed a remarkable um, uh, result. And then in patients who got structured early palliative care visits with metastatic non-small lung cancer, you saw an improvement both in qual multiple quality of life measures and in survival. Um, and this got ASCO and others to start thinking about the benefit of early palliative care interventions in patients with malignant disease. And so we started um, thinking about that and, and thinking about how we might want to implement that in our practice. 
This work was led by Lauren Hemminger, who was a medical student at the time um, and continued these projects as a resident, now as a fellow and will be joining our faculty next year. Um, and what she started with is just looking at a decedent cohort in our practice. So patients who we had followed from diagnosis all the way to death um, and looked at our, um, how we met uh, end of life quality measures. And the key measure um, that we, we felt like we were struggling with um, and that we were disappointed with was advanced directive documentation by the third oncology visit. Here you can see that about 50% of patients had that. And this is a pretty low bar for advanced directive documentation. This could, have, this could have been something as simple as a healthcare proxy. But what she found in her study was that only about a half of patients had this documentation. And then when we looked later in their time scores, um, few had documentation of life-sustaining treatment orders. So things like DNR, DNI, um, whether they wanted to go into the hospital. Um, and in the last 20% of their life um, was when most people were doing this documentation. And it was often being done by proxy. So it was being done by a family member and patients weren't able to express their choices on what they want, presumably from medical or cognitive issues. And that 35% died in some kind of a hospital setting. And what we noted here is that we had no documentation of patients' wishes on this, of where they wanted to die and what their um, goals were in, in dying. Um, and so we couldn't really assess whether this, these deaths were concordant with their, um, their thoughts about life and death. Um, Lauren further pursued this work and she designed a prospective study evaluating quality of life, both in patients and in caregivers. And so patients and caregivers were enrolled, they received the standard care we would do, but what they got was a um, referral to palliative care. And we had talked to the palliative care division about doing some structured visits similar to the New England Journal paper. And we studied the feasibility of the palliative care referral here. We got patient and caregiver quality of life surveys that we did prospectively every three months. Um, and we addressed caregiver time burden and got some qualitative information as well the ultimate goal to also look at whether implementation of a palliative care referral would have any impact on end of life quality measures. She enrolled 75 patients and 100 caregivers as a medical student um, and found um, a couple of items. This data is actually just maturing and is going to be presented in an oral session at um, the A and at the, um, in April. Um, and she found that the, the burden and distress, not surprisingly, is substantial early in the patient's disease course, that this starts, this starts right away, and patient and caregivers are spending a substantial amount of their time on um, caring for their uh, patient. And patients who were spending more time had higher distress scores. We did a companion qualitative analysis. This is led by Julia Gomez, who is a medical student with us, is now a neurology intern um, at uh, uh, at North Shore. Um, and, and when she looked at the qualitative work here, and this also is going to be presented at the AN, she found that the key thing um, that caregivers were struggling with early in diagnosis is this idea of coping with their, their loved one's diagnosis, their mortality, the uncertainty, that they, were, they really had gaps in sort of knowledge and understanding about what's going on that caused them a lot of distress. So Lauren's work on the palliative care referral um, had some surprising results to us. And we, we really found that um, implementing this referral ended up being nearly impossible for us. Um, and we ended up stopping partway through the study. Um, in 36 patients that we referred, only two were able to complete the, structured, the three structured visits that we were recommending. And there were a lot of reasons for this. Patients didn't wanna come back. Caregivers had to take time off to come back. There was distance. Um, they went to initial visit, they didn't quite see the benefit of it. And we started realizing that our patients with brain tumors are very different than our patients with metastatic non-small lung, ca lung cancer. And a lot of their supportive care needs, their symptom burdens were really neurologic and needed to still be taken care of us, care of by folks like us. And those were things like headaches, um, aphasia, hemiparesis, cognitive dysfunctions, um, and those, those clearly felt within the realm of, of what a neurologist does. So we stopped um, doing these referrals and, and really started rethinking how to approach this. So when we bring in the design thinking approach to this, those early studies really focused on empathizing, understanding 
patient, caregivers, and physician um, needs and interest in this. Really defining the problem, which we originally thought might have been a palliative care referral issue, um, and we changed that to really rethink how can we better improve advanced care planning uh, for our patients. Uh, and we came up with the idea of creating a structured advanced care planning visit. So similar to chemotherapy teaching visits that we might do early in the course of a patient with glioblastoma, we decided to have a structured separate visit related to advanced care planning. Our prototype for this was that this should be done early within the first couple of months of diagnosis. We wanted some structure to it so that we could disseminate and have others be able to do that as well. We wanted to include caregivers and family members. Um, and we wanted to create a structure where this could also be nurse and APP led. And our initial prototype, we found that we had several barriers. We continue to have this geographic barrier of patients coming in for visits. Um, and after having to come in to see a neurosurgeon and a radiation oncologist coming in sometimes for regular radiation, and then seeing neuro-oncologists as well as a primary care physician, um, that extra burden of coming in for an extra visit was not something that patients wanted. And it was also a challenge for their caregivers and loved ones who had uh, difficulty with having to take time off from work. Um, we also had barriers with clinic space. So patients, um, um, so from our perspective, we struggled with this because we had a finite number of clinic rooms and these visits often took an hour up to two hours at times. Um, we had limitations on time. And then another barrier that hit was that the pandemic started and it didn't make sense to bring patients in for these kinds of visits um, when we were limiting um, in-person interactions. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and we decided to trial doing these visits by telehealth. Um, and we were a little worried about doing this. And, and how, do you, how do you have such a sensitive, difficult conversation with a patient when they are um, on video um, and you're not, you're not there in person with them? So we, we started doing this um, on our own outside of a clinical study. Um, on the left is a picture um, of a family that we did this with in the center as a patient. We have multiple providers on this. Um, and we have three daughters who live on three different continents. And what we found was that in doing this through telehealth, we were better able to engage family members. And importantly, we could often get adult children um, or important family members who didn't live in the region. Patients found um, comfort in being in their own homes. So after doing a visit like this and having a difficult conversation, they were able to, they were at home. They didn't have to go from a sterile clinic room to check out off to a parking garage and sometimes a couple of hour drive home. Um, we found that it was beneficial to do this outside of any discussion of an MRI, which added a different layer of emotional complexity to the visits. We had obviously less impact on room management because we didn't need clinic rooms with this. And we found that this was effective with nurses and APPs. Now we've done about 40 visits of this. Um, and in general, I would say that on our clinical practice, we felt like this has been a really important addition. Um, but Meredith Pescatello, who's a first year medical student, is going to be studying this to sort of ensure that that is the case. Um, and she's going to be doing qualitative interviews of patients, caregivers and family members, but also of the providers who have conducted the visits to see how we're doing with them. And we are also going to test this. So we're looking at early telehealth visits for advanced care planning and malignant gliomas. This is a protocol being led by Sarah Hardy, who's one of our faculty members. She's doing this along with Benzie Kluger, who's one of our neuropalliative care faculty. We'll be enrolling patients with malignant gliomas, consenting them to go through this process. We have a pre-visit guide that they get. We invite them to engage family members and caregivers with it. We do this um, predominantly over video. We did include an option for phone um, in case some patients didn't have um, access to Wi-Fi, but we've, we've been able to address that by having iPads um, and mobile hotspots that we can provide to patients. Um, and then we're following patient experience on this, caregiver experience, um, a provider experience, um, and then looking again at documentation of advanced care planning and end of life outcomes. Um, we've, we've just started this a few months ago and we've enrolled about 15 patients. Our hope is to eventually be able to disseminate this a little bit further um, if this ends up uh, having um, positive results. And this is funded um, by one of our cancer control pilot grants. And so I believe go there is uh, someone who has uh, raised their hand here. 
um, do yeah. would you like to just save all questions for the end? I apologize for the interruption. Yeah, I'm okay taking a question if it's yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll allow her. Your Diane, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand. I hit that button by mistake. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so um, if we go back to our design thinking model here, um, so our, sorry, our prototype here now is this telehealth structured advanced care planning that we're looking at qualitative measures on. And our test here is this protocol um, and seeing um, does that really have the impact on the outcomes that we're looking at? So another um, series of patients that influenced us was, was, were those um, that had epilepsy. So um, this was a woman who was 42. She had a diagnosis of glioblastoma. She hadn't had seizures at baseline, so she was not on an anti-epileptic drug. Um, and that's um, consistent with current guidelines that if patients haven't had um, a seizure with a brain tumor, they don't need anti-epileptic therapy. But she then developed her first seizure three months after diagnosis. She happened to be dropping off her daughter at college. Um, she started having focal seizures in the car. Um, we tried to manage these with a local pharmacy and started using some medications that we gave orally. The focal seizures progressed. She ultimately went into focal status epilepticus and then generalized status epilepticus. And then during this time um, of her, her, her daughter starting her freshman year, she was in the hospital for about two weeks um, at, at outside of away from home. And we had several other stories like this that just made us start rethinking um, our approach uh, to epilepsy in these patients and also starting to think about the real burden that seizures can have on some, on, on some of these patients. So this work has been led by Tom Wychowski who directs our tumor related epilepsy clinic and Andrea Wesluski who was one of our residents and fellows and a faculty member. Um, and they've done a series of studies um, looking at ways to start reducing the burden of tumor-related epilepsy. Um, and the key things that they have found in this work, um, and not, is that not surprisingly, about half of patients with, it, with GBM develop seizures within their lifetime. And that makes you just sort of think, you know, if we know that 50% of patients with GBM are going to develop seizures, um, we really need to be thinking about whether there is some role for prophylaxis and rethinking the studies that have been done over the years. Um, especially with the knowledge that there's minimal toxicity with newer generation AEDs. And we found that as well in our studies. We also found that this is the leading cause of acute care visits in patients with GBM. So patients who are coming into the emergency room, sometimes getting admitted, um, and sometimes going on to the ICU if they had more significant seizures. A lot of the emergency room visits we found patients were coming in, and by the time that they came in, um, they were able to go home. They had a seizure and they had completely resolved didn't necessarily need any further workup. And we've also done work that's found that non-surgical inpatient costs, so admissions after diagnosis, um, end up being about half of patient costs in patients with GBM. Um, and that's pretty substantial for a disease that is largely an outpatient disease. Um, and so thinking about ways in which we should be trying to reduce hospital admissions for these patients. So Tom um, has taken this further um, in trying to better understand. So this is that kind of step in empathy of understanding um, what patients are going through with tumor-related epilepsy. So he designed a prospective cohort study um, and we are, he's actually done with enrollment of patients and is in the process of analyzing this work, but enrolled patients with high-grade gliomas and really studying um, health-related quality of life, um, clinical features, seizure semiology, um, at diagnosis and um, through their first year um, since diagnosis. Um, and goals of these studies are one, to be able to get some good data to be able to inform that next step in cl clinical trials. One of the challenges of previous clinical trials in prophylaxis was understanding the outcomes and the real rates of epilepsy in this population. And a second potential outcome here is to think about whether we can start developing a risk score for those patients who, who really might be at high risk of developing epilepsy. In parallel to that, um, and as part of a Neuronext fellowship, he designed a study looking at brevateracetam and the prophylaxis of tumor-related epilepsy. 
Um, our initial goals here um, are to look at safety and tolerability. Um, I'll be honest, the main reason we're using bervatiracetam is because the company was willing to fund that. Um, and we're looking at a couple of outcomes here. One is, is there any way that with adding this drug on top of all the other medications that patients with um, brain tumors have that we're adding to toxicity? And then the second is um, looking at the feasibility of randomization. Um, this was one of the challenges in previous studies. Remember, these patients tend to be at a point where they have a new diagnosis of a brain tumor. They're often going on clinical trials for their um, therapies of their brain tumor. Um, and is it feasible to layer this on with another clinical trial? And other outcomes to inform um, phase two trials are going to be looking at time to first seizure um, and, then, and then the overall incidence of tumor-related epilepsy. Andrea has tried to approach this in a different way and, and in trying to kind of reduce the burden on patients. Um, and she devised an um, epilepsy education intervention. This is a um, set of about 10 PowerPoint slides that her and other providers will give in the clinic to a patient and their caregiver, educating them about seizures, um, how to manage them at home, who to call, when to call, um, and try, trying to give them guidance on um, what to do in those situations with the ultimate goal of trying to reduce um, in unnecessary admissions or hospitalizations. She found in this work that this was feasible. We were able to incorporate this into our clinic flow. Patients found it um, helpful. Caregivers found it helpful. They had improvement in their sort of test scores and understanding of seizures over time. And it actually caused them less distress. We were a little worried about talking to them about seizures, especially in patients who had never had a seizure and whether that would worsen their distress about things. And when we looked at qualitative data, patients felt informed and powered. And Andrea started designing um, a prospective intervention study at, of this, starting to look at whether this could actually reduce inpatient, um, inpatient utilization. Um, but what she noticed was that despite having um, these interventions and patients feeling benefits from the interventions, they were still coming into the hospital. And so she started um, asking patients when they were in the emergency room or when they got admitted and finding out why did they come in. And we found that they were doing all the right things and then they were calling us. And when they called overnight, they would get um, overnight covering providers, which for us at the time were neurology residents or hematology oncology fellows who often told them to came, come in. And when they called during the day, they got an initial triage nurse, um, an oncology triage nurse, who as soon as they heard the word seizure would also tell them to come in. So we thought about um, educating all of these folks um, and but we thought that that would be pretty daunting with the turnover that we have in residents, fellows, and in triage nursing. Um, so Andrea devised um, a different approach to this. Um, and this is a study that she has designed and has applied for funding for. Um, and this is a pilot study, a simple study in newly diagnosed GBMs where they would undergo that seizure education intervention. Um, but after that, they would be given information um, for a hotline where they would have direct access to one of the neuro-oncology providers. So they'd be able to pick up their phone, call, get one of us directly, um, and then we would be able to talk them through next steps of what to do. Um, this has not opened yet. We're going through some of the logistics of figuring out the hotline piece of this, but outcomes here we're looking at are feasibility from the patient perspective. Um, do patients remember to call? Do they find that number? Um, do they call for the right reasons? Feasibility from the provider perspective, is this feasible in terms of um, the number and volume of calls that we might get and our um, need to respond right away? And then um, does, it, does the intervention have any impact um, on, what, and sorry, what is the intervention that we do when we get called? So when that patient gets called, um, how many times are we able to avoid um, an inpatient visit or hospitalization, or are we mostly still sending them to the hospital? Now, the next set of patients that really informed our priorities were, um, were patients with all kinds of primary brain tumors. Um, this case is really a composite case, 45-year-old woman with a low-grade glioma. And over the years, we saw patients with low-grade gliomas who did not get the surgeries they needed, would get biopsy only despite some evidence that greater resections were beneficial. We saw patients with um, primary brain tumors and gliomas who didn't get genetic testing that would better help us inform the therapies that they needed. And we saw patients um, who were getting radiated when we felt like it could have been observed, um, and those who weren't getting radiated when we felt like they should have gotten radiation. And more recently, patients 
um, with lower grade tumors who weren't getting um, chemotherapy when there were indications. Um, and what we found is that there's that in the community where medical oncologists um, see brain tumors as such a small percentage um, of their practice, that there were real gaps in keeping up to date in the therapeutics, but also keeping up in the classification and understanding um, of these brain tumors. So about four years ago um, on the ASCO Guidelines Advisory Committee, we um, advocated for the development of guidelines geared towards uh, medical oncologists in the United States um, for gliomas. Um, and that was based on a couple of things that had really changed. One was a shift in therapeutics. So several clinical trials over the last 15 years that have demonstrated some benefit for chemotherapy across glioma subtypes and a shift in genomics. Um, so a better understanding of um, the genetics of our brain tumors and how that actually impacts both prognosis and classification. Um, so this paper landmark from about um, more than 10 years ago demonstrated that, that in tumors that harbored the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, um, patients had significantly um, improved survival independent of the types of treatment that they got. Um, and then a more recent paper um, looking at low gr lower grade gliomas that really showed that, that the genetics of these tumors sometimes trump the histology. So the key finding in this paper here, if you look at the orange line all the way on the left, um, these are patients with traditional glioblastomas or what we now call IDH wild type glioblastomas. And the line that cl is closest to it with the red triangles are low grade gliomas. So people who would histologically um, have a diagnosis of low grade glioma in the past who we might expect a survival of five plus years. Um, but when they have the, when they don't have an IDH mutation in our IDH wild type, um, this paper revealing that those patients had pretty similar uh, survival to those patients with GBM. So this shift in genomics has then led to a shift in classification. We've had a couple of updates of the World Health Organization criteria. Um, and the key challenge of this guideline was how to manage that shift in therapeutics with the shift in classification. The trials that were dictating how we should treat these patients were done prior to some of these understandings of genomics and classification. Um, and that meant that we had to reinterpret a lot of these trials to better understand how do we interpret that today? And how does a medical oncologist out in the community faced with a contemporary path report make decisions based on older trials? Um, a quick sidebar here, as, as kind of I've emphasized, the, the real purpose of these guidelines were, were geared to um, medical oncologists in the community, and I think are less valuable to our neuro-oncology co colleagues at Academic Medical Center. But one of the really valuable resources in these guidelines is actually the data supplement, um, which is going to show you a real repository of essentially all randomized clinical trials with their outcomes um, across glioma subtypes um, over the past 20 years. So the key table in our guideline um, is uh, this one, and I had the privilege of working on this with um, my colleague, Dr. J. Shree Blakely at Johns Hopkins. We put together a table um, intended for medical oncologists and others to be able to look at the WHO 2021, so the most recent classification um, of primary brain tumors. That's in this middle column over here. Um, and what those tumor types would have been called five years ago or more recently, um, based on the WHO 2016 guidelines, um, and what they would have been called more than five years ago, um, based on the WHO 2007 gu guidelines. So this is kind of a key that helps us understand modern classification and what that meant um, for previous classification. Um, and this, in a nutshell, are the guidelines. I'm not going to go into these in a lot of detail, um, but I highlight a couple of key points. One is you don't see any guidelines um, for recurrent um, glioblastoma or recurrent gliomas on this. Um, and that was because we didn't really have any clear evidence um, to make a clear guideline in any of those settings and recommended um, consideration of clinical trial when available. The second is that um, when we looked at the treatment of newly, newly diagnosed IDH mutant gliomas, um, we really tried um, to, to incorporate some nuance um, and not be entirely algorithmic. 
um, because the decisions on this are not always clear. So for instance, many of these patients, um, um, a guideline would recommend use of a combination chemotherapy regimen called PCV. That's not used as much in the United States and we wanted to give some flexibility based on some other data um, to be able to use other regimens when toxicity was a concern. We also wanted to incorporate the idea that in some of these patients, timing of treatment was not clear um, and there are opportunities to defer therapy and to defer radiation um, until later if possible. And then the last thing I want to highlight from these guidelines is our recommendations for treatment of glioblastoma in older or frail adults. Um, if you read these guidelines, it, it really kind of indicates that we don't have a clear path here. Despite a number of um, prospective and randomized clinical trials in older patients with malignant gliomas, um, when we're faced with a patient sitting in front of us, um, we don't have a great understanding of what choices to make. We don't understand which of these patients are really going to suffer from significant toxicities from these regimens um, and which are going to benefit the most from these regimens. Um, so as you can see from the guidelines here, we give a whole sort of series of different options, but we don't have the decision tools to tell oncologists um, exactly how to approach care for these patients. This is something that we have tried to um, begin to address, um, and we're just starting work in this area. Andrea Wasilewski did a study looking specifically at geriatric syndromes and treatment toxicities in malignant gliomas. One of the things we know from the medical oncology literature is that clinical trials tend to underestimate treatment toxicities, particularly in older patients. We also know that performance status that we typically use is not a good indicator in older patients of survival or of toxicity. So what she found um, is that about a quarter of our patients who are older, median age in this cohort was 70, um, had, had hematologic toxicities that resulted in dose reductions or dose, dose delays during concurrent temidar. 50% had dose reductions or delays during adjuvant temidar. And surprisingly, 15% required a platelet transfusion at some point. Um, so really needing a different level of care. Um, what she also found is that more than 90% of older patients had non-elective admissions. So they came in for some kind of issue um, at some point later in their course. More than half of them, more than 60% had falls that were documented. Um, and that at time of diagnosis, the median number of medications in these patients was 11. And that's before we would then start chemotherapy, anti-emetic drugs, and a whole host of other supportive care medications. Survival was actually, it wasn't significant, but in patients who had more polypharmacy um, had um, lower survival. So one angle we're taking on this is trying to address the polypharmacy issue. And we're working with our pharmacists um, to develop an intervention to sit down and really look at medications when older patients are newly diagnosed and see what we can remove from the list. Um, and then a second area is to start to look at whether um, incorporating geriatric assessments um, may help us in some of this decision-making. Comprehensive geriatric assessment has pretty strong data for it in the medical oncology literature, demonstrating that you can reduce treatment toxicities from chemotherapy regimens without altering outcome, survival outcome. Um, those largely excluded patients with primary brain tumors. So here, Sarah Hardy is leading a study um, in patients over the age of 65 with IDH wild-type glioblastomas um, patients will, after consent, will get a comprehensive geriatric assessment prior to treatment initiation. These assessments involve um, uh, a series of validated tools that assess cognition, walking, fitness, home safety, um, and social support, um, and then um, allow us to make recommendations on treatment. Right now, we're not making any of those recommendations. We're doing the care as we would. Um, and we're looking to see, one, um, is, this, is this feasible in our clinic? Are we, able to, are we able to do this? This is an extra visit for patients. This can take 60 plus minutes to do. Um, and then uh, do any of the results from this, does any of this indicate which patients might be more prone to getting toxicities, which might be more prone to getting geriatric syndromes? Are we better able to identify frailty from the geriatric assessment? Um, and are there any links uh, to survival? So this study um, has recently opened. We've enrolled about 
um, 20 patients. It's also a study where looking for sort of partners across the country um, so that we can um, get more patients on this. Now, as we go back to the map I showed, um, this map ended, ended up being sort of a critical part of our thinking on how to, how to develop and grow and build a program um, and how to think about the patients who are in our community. Um, but you don't know what you don't know. Um, and one of the things that I did not know as we started um, is I did not have familiarity with this map. Um, this is a map of Rochester, New York that's called, this is the red lining map of Rochester, New York. And the areas in red here show the districts or the areas um, that um, most of our population um, who are black live in. In the other areas, um, historic laws um, prevented black individuals um, from living in those communities. Um, and when we look at those redlining maps across the United States today, we find that these correlate well with health disparities and other socioeconomic outcomes. Um, and this is the legacy of racism um, in the United States. Uh, and so one of the things we have tried to do now is pay a little bit more attention to the populations that I think that we have often ignored in our clinical program building. Um, in Rochester itself, we prided ourselves on um, being the home of uh, Fred Frederick Douglass. It's the area where he, where he felt most at home and published his um, anti-slavery paper, The North Star. If you, if you were to be able to look out the window um, over here in my office, you can see the Mount Hope Cemetery um, where he is buried. Um, but it's also a town that has um, continued challenges um, with racism, um, with segregation in our school systems, um, and similar um, problems with police violence um, that we've seen all over the country. This isn't really just the story of Rochester, it's the story of the United States, um, and those expend, extend to the health of our patients. Um, this publication by a group called Common Ground Health here in Rochester demonstrated that African-Americans face higher risk from COVID-19, they're more likely to be hospitalized for chronic conditions, and independent of socioeconomic status, um, they're more likely to die earlier. And so um, we have tried to address this somewhat in neuro-oncology, but it's been tough. Um, this paper um, found that we had real disparities in patient enrollment on clinical trials when we looked at a clinicaltrials.gov database. Um, and uh, we had a hard time actually looking at race on this. There were age disparities and um, there were some geographic disparities, but um, most papers weren't publishing uh, race uh, in, in that table one of a clinical trial. Um, a similar study uh, being led by one of our undergraduate students, Camille Stevenson, who's doing this as part of a summer undergraduate research fellowship for um, students who are underrepresented, um, has found uh, disparities in primary CNS lymphoma trials. And here she was able to find um, some age disparity, real geographic disparities between rural and urban, um, and then racial disparities, both for black and Hispanic populations. And she'll be presenting this poster um, at the AEN. Other work has also demonstrated in medical oncology and now increasingly in neuro-oncology, some real disparities in clinical trial enrollment. We're having a harder time being able to um, assess that in clinical practice. When we're looking at this from a design thinking perspective, <clears throat> um, one of the things that design thinking, um, I think, helps us with is really drilling down what the core problem is. Um, and we can make all kinds of modifications to clinical trials. We can change in um, criteria. We can change access and, and where they are held, and we should be doing those things. Um, but we also need to address the underlying problems that are causing these. And even as we change systems and structures, we have to recognize um, the impact of racism on people um, and the prevalence of racism in our communities. Um, and looking at a levels of analysis chart here, how can we impact racism as a defining problem um, at the individual level? So how people think about this at the intergroup level, how people communicate with each other, and at an institutional level, how can we change system structures and policies? And we've, um, we've done some work on this in our own department, um, creating what we call an ideas council several years ago that is inclusive of all members of our department um, and launched several key working groups looking at different areas of diversity and inclusion. Um, and a core one of these right now is an anti-racism working group where we have an anti-racism action plan aimed to address racism 
in our academic structures, our educational structures, and in patient care. We've also tried to address this on a national level with, um, so along with Nick Day in your department, um, we put together a framework of what a diversity officer should be doing in an academic neurology department, what kind of support they should be getting, um, ranging from salary and administrative support. Interestingly, this pub paper was published in early 2021. So I would say that even as the time it got published, it was probably out of date. Um, because in 2020, we had a lot of changes in our recognition and understanding of racism in the United States. And our academic medical centers have decided to put more resources into this work. And what I would say today is that in an academic department, one person serving as a diversity officer is probably insufficient. Um, and we really need to be thinking about um, more broad input from multiple faculty members. In our own department, we'll, we're changing that um, to include this over several positions. Um, so we're creating an ideas executive council. Um, in that we'll have a director of DEI. So this is a non-faculty full-time staff member um, that would be fully funded to develop strategy and vision specifically for DEI. They would be at the level of a administrative person who directs operations or finance and report directly to the chair. We'll be recruiting for an associate chair for health equity, someone who is really focused on that clinical piece um, of how we change our clinical practices to better implement health equity. Um, we've hired community engagement representatives, so people who are out in the community who can help us better engage with and interact with the community. My role in the department is as associate chair for career development and leadership, um, which is similar to an academic affairs role. And so in that role, we really work on things like promotions, salary equity, compensation, um, and faculty, faculty development programs that overcome some under-mentoring of women and, and those who are underrepresented. And then um, specific roles related to um, pipeline programs who would then work with residency program directors. I think looking forward, we're probably trying to create a specific research role um, that would fit on this council as well. But goals here are to really codify this work within academic departments and um, to, um, to, to integrate anti-racism across all of our missions. And then other work um, that we are doing at a national level is, um, is through the AEN. So the AEN Anti-Racism Education Program, um, this uh, comes out of a grant um, from the Health Equity Innovation Fund sponsored by Genentech. This grant was um, written by Christy Phelps, the former executive director of the AEN and Jeff McLean. We've hired an um, anti-racism consultant, um, uh, a psychiatrist, Jessica Isom, who does this um, work. And um, this actually launched uh, just on Monday, on March 14th. Um, and as we um, developed this program, we actually intentionally used design thinking um, in how we created this. Um, and here we really spent time initially on empathizing and thinking through the populations we wanted to serve. And that was neurologists all across the country in different roles. And we wanted to make sure that we were creating programming that was um, specific to neurologists. So made for neurologists by neurologists. Um, and that gave examples of how this specifically affected neurologic patients, neurologic academic structures, um, and neurologic colleagues. We spent some real time defining what we thought were the core problems. Those were a lack of knowledge and um, understanding about the history of racism of something that I suffered from myself, despite having gone through um, an outstanding public school um, and secondary education in this country. Um, understanding the extent to which racism affects colleagues, um, and then uh, understanding the direct effects of racism on patients and their outcomes today. Um, and then finally, once you kind of learn all of those things, what are the things that we can do to make change um, within our own environments. So we created these four modules um, to address these core problems. This is an online format. It's intended to be done um, over several months um, so that you have some built-in time for reflection. It's interactive. This I would say right now is a prototype. We've already gotten some feedback from some that they would like to hear have this in a podcast format. And we'll be, um, we'll be creating something like that in the next couple of months. Um, and we'll be providing some more information about this module um, at the AEN. Um, it's something I highly recommend. I'll admit that I'm biased about it, um, but it's something that our working group has really spent some time on um, and um, carved out really dedicated um, for neurologists.
So finally, um, we started this by talking about how our patients impact our priorities, but we also need to be thinking about how our priorities impact our patients. Um, this patient here is a young woman um, who presented with nausea, vomiting, ataxia, um, and had four ED visits before she got an MRI of the brain. She was 24 with no prior medical problems. Um, she didn't have great access to a primary care physician. Um, she was black and lived here in the city. Um, ultimately, she got this MRI and ultimately we were able to diagnose her with primary CNS lymphoma. Um, she went through methotrexate-based chemotherapy regimen, had complete response to this, um, and is still alive today. If you can see, it's a little hard to see, but on this scan, she ended up developing um, oliveri hypertrophy. Um, and she has a lot of permanent disabilities from this tumor. Um, and so today is largely needing a wheelchair, um, is ataxic, has real difficulty with speech, um, and has um, some palatal movements that are hard to control. Um, and these are things that are not gonna get better. We at the time recognized um, that, that um, she wasn't served well by multiple separate emergency rooms um, and that she was, she was essentially blown off um, despite having a real neurologic presentation and um, not having any other prior kinds of histories and was given a diagnosis of depression. Um, what we didn't recognize at the time and what we didn't call out at the time was, was that this was really about racism. Um, and that's something that I hope we can change um, and think about um, as we see our patients today. One of the things that I think is so positive about design thinking is this idea of empathy um, and how um, we really focus on understanding the perspectives of people and patients and caregivers and providers. Um, but we need to be really intentional about that empathy to make sure that we're listening to everyone. Um, and when I look back at the work we did in the first five to 10 years um, of this program, um, there were entire populations that we were not really thinking about um, on what their needs were um, and, and what would benefit them. Um, so just a last plug to really advocate for broad, inclusive thinking when we're thinking of um, some, some of this clinical problem solving um, and clinical program development. So I wanna thank you for inviting me uh, for Grand Rounds today. I enjoyed um, spending some time with you. I wish it was in person. Feel free to connect with me by email or on Twitter. Um, I'm always looking for friends, collaborators, mentors, mentees, um, anyone who um, is willing to talk or work. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, thanks again for coming to Douglas. Now, the structure of this is such that um, if we, if there are any questions, you will have to uh, uh, kind of raise your hand, use the raise your hand option, uh, and uh, or put the put the question into the chat, um, and that way we can actually see uh, what it is that you'd like to say. So, we we do have a few minutes here. So, if there is any questions. Um, we have one here. Uh, let me. Hey, Namish, Scott Bakken here. Nice to see you. Thank you for a, a great talk and all this exciting work in neuro oncology. Um, I guess my question: Could you expand a little bit on some of the efforts uh, to um, within neurology? You have a very unique vantage point, not only in neuro oncology but in neurology. Um, in terms of attracting more underrepresented minorities into neurology and then hiring them in the faculty, um, you know, as a field, we haven't done great, not for lack of trying, but I think your, your work highlights this iterative model of you try something and then you go back and, and do the cycle again. So any other thoughts you can share with us on that? Yeah, so, so I'd agree with that. These iterative models are really the way, the way to go. The, the challenge with this, is um, when we're looking at pipeline work, much of which is being done, um, should needs to be done kind of K through 12. Um, you, we need to be starting that early. Um, it's a decade before you have a sense of whether a pipeline program that you're working on is having some impact of getting that person into medicine. Um, my thoughts on these are that pipeline programs should be really broad on, on just really engaging those in un, who are underrepresented into science and into medicine and into healthcare. Um, I'm not sure that it makes sense to put real efforts to get folks into neurology at that level. Um, I think that we have some gaps um, in where we could get 
um, underrepresented folks into neurology. Um, and I think one of those key gaps is um, between the first and second year of medical school. So patient, so um, people who we know are gonna be physicians um, who are not yet necessarily differentiated um, and creating kind of targeted um, experiences where they can have either clinical or research experiences before they have other clinical exposures um, and, um, and then and getting them engaged. We know that people go into fields because they find mentors and um, they have experiences and they get exposed to it. And so how can we kind of really incre increase that exposure at that, at that point? The American Society for Clinical Oncology is doing this in oncology. We were part of this program this year. Um, we had 10 underrepresented folks in oncology. All 10 of them now have some interest in that field. Um, and as they go into their second, third, and fourth years, I suspect several of them will be retained within oncology. So what can we do to develop sort of um, parallel programs in neurology? Um, the last piece I'll say about this is that there's a lot of focus on recruiting individuals who are underrepresented um, into our department, and a lot of departments are making a lot of efforts to this. I think you need, we need to recognize that an estimate is that there's probably about um, you know, under 500 black neurologists um, in, in academia, and uh, under 500 black neurologists in the United States, and fewer in academia. Um, and a lot of what we're doing with these recruitment efforts is moving people around. Um, and so we, we do need to be spending more of our time on the pipeline, um, rather than in recruiting someone away from another institution um, into another institution. Just as a retort, that thank you for that answer. Do you think there's anything that we should be doing then if it's a pipeline issue? I think that's the challenge for us is you sit here and you say, okay, K through 12, I'm not gonna do anything there. It's a great suggestion about medical schools, you know, between first and second year, but what's the rallying call? What's our call to arms for where we are in academic neurology to make this work? Yeah. Is there one yet? Yeah, so I, I don't know if we're ready yet. I, I'd say the first thing is um, we should not assume that when we are hosting medical students or undergraduate students in our in our departments, um, that we are not continually um, um, being racist um, in the way we treat individuals, in the way we talk about individuals, in the structures that we have. Um, and and I think um, one of the things we really need to do is make sure that we're kind of cleaning up our academic departments and our structures and our policies and our systems and our recognition of racism. Um, and so that when, when we do have access to other individuals, that they're coming in and feel welcomed and want to be here. One of the things, if you, if you ever go on um, um, hashtag Black in the Ivory um, on Twitter and read through the examples, what you find um, is that at academic programs all over the country, and this is sort of across academics, um, that we're literally pushing individuals who are Black out of, out of academia. Um, at, at sort of multiple levels. And I think there's a lot there that we need to fix. I agree with focusing on the pipeline, but I think we also need to fix um, what we're doing um, and have a little bit more insight into that. Great answer, thank you very much. We have time for maybe one more question here. In that case, thank you so much again, Dr. Mahila, for your time and an excellent talk. And thank you so much. I appreciate it.